Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Bill Magwood. I'm Director General of the uh, Nuclear Energy Agency. Uh, today's guest is Director General of the Air National Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Mariano Grossi. Um, Mr. Grossi took office as Director General in uh, December uh, 2019. He's a senior diplomat with over 35 years of experience in fields of nonproliferation and disarmament. Uh, Mr. Grossi was Argentina's ambassador to Austria and its representative to the IEEA and other Vienna-based international organizations from 2013 to 2019. And during this time, he presided over several important conferences in the nuclear do domain. He also served as Assistant Director General for Policy and Chief of Cabinet at the IEEA from 2010 to 2013. From 2007 to 2009, he held the position of Political Affairs Director General with the Argentine Foreign Service. He was Chief of Cabinet at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in La Hague, and from 2002 to 2007. And um, after what is probably too short of an explanation of your background, uh, Raphael, welcome. And it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Um, I will open, I will start by saying that uh, first, uh, you are, of course, a longtime friend and, and colleague, and it's a great pleasure to have you um, as Director General of the IEEA. Uh, and of course, the IEEA and the NEA are very close collaborative organizations that work very closely together to advance uh, nuclear safety and technology. So it's a great pleasure to have you all with us today. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, and it's a pleasure also to, to, be, to be with you in this uh, very, very interesting series of web chats that you've been having. With, I think everybody has, has been following that. So uh, I feel very honored uh, to have been invited. And like you say, I think uh, we, we, we've been working together for a long time, but I think that um, we are doing it even more now, uh, which is uh, only logical as our two uh, organizations uh, have so many areas of convergence and, 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 and potential to do much more. I feel terribly comfortable uh, with you, with your colleagues, whom uh, we will always welcome here in Vienna. And hopefully when the pandemic um, allows um, we can also perhaps um, can see you guys in Paris. Anyway, um, it's, it, it's, it's a great opportunity to exchange. I know that we have many participants that are distinguished colleagues, uh, but also, and hopefully, uh, people who uh, want to know more or, and, want, and know very little about what we do, because that is the audience that we need to, uh, to reach. And I'm sure that with activities like this, that you are uh, carrying out we are going to be better at doing that. But let's get on with it. Well, let's, let's start with uh, the fact that you, so you've been director general now for about 10 months. And what have you learned in that period of time? What's, uh, has there been any surprises? Well, uh, well, there's a, there's a one big one uh, for everybody, I guess, um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the pandemic. Let me say, as you were uh, just recalling, um, uh, I was with the agency before, and I think my first meeting at, uh, here in Vienna at the agency was in uh, 1985 as a young Argentine diplomat. So I've been coming to this place for, for a long time, for many, many decades. Um, so um, uh, I, I would say that uh, the, uh, while there were no surprises, what we always see is that uh, there are um, areas where we have to work and then and there are, there are uh, new things that come our, our, our way. I think that for, for all of us, and I'm sure that for um, the NEA, um, working under pandemic uh, conditions was, was quite uh, unique, especially for us. We are, you know, the essence, in the essence of our work is to go out and inspect. So uh, to go out uh, in a world that is closed down, uh, it is quite difficult. And I, I would say that's, that was the biggest thing because uh, when, 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 at least here in Vienna, I don't know, in Paris, but in Vienna uh, on Friday, March uh, 13th, uh, the country went locked down. And, and there we could decide, go right or left. Um, all the other inspe international inspectorates, as you know, they decided to pause, and we took a decision not to do so. Uh, of course, that is, you know, it's easier said than done. Uh, firstly, because you have to go out and explain to the foreign ministries and to the border control authorities all over the world that uh, these uh, inspectors were coming anyway. 
And then you had to find ways to, to, to go because commercial flights were no longer available. So we had to mount a, a, a big, big logistical operation. And, uh, and fortunately, we were able to maintain the continuity of the inspector the inspection effort and and this continues unfortunately now we are again in a difficult uh, part of the curve uh, at least in western europe in other parts of the world it is also the case and we have to continue facing this um, uh, this uh, problems mm. so um uh, i would say uh, that that, that what, what i learned is that when you have um, a group of dedicated people and you have member states that are behind you and they support your decision, you can do it. Well, you know, it's, it's, in, in that respect, you know, as you, you and I saw each other in Vienna in the margins of the general conference this year, yeah. and uh, congratu congratulations on being able to have um, a, at least a partially physical general conference. And this is the first time, I think, in history of, of the IEEA that you had um, this sort of hybrid approach where some people online and on video and other people in person. Yes. What did what what was the experience like? Did did it work well? Were you happy with the outcome? Well, listen, uh, you mentioned uh, the general conference. Um, that was uh, that was tricky, and even trickier was the the, the board of governors that we had in March in the month of uh, June, because there we had as uh, those who follow nuclear all things nuclear. I'm talking about non proliferation. For those who are following that, may may have known we were at the rough patch. Uh, with uh, regards to one of our main proliferation um, issues with the Islamic Republic of Iran. And the issue is, and it happened also at the Security Council, that some countries, including the countries that, are, that have permanent seats in the, in, in the Security Council, were adamantly opposed to anything uh, which would be considered as, for example, voting uh, by, in this way, remotely, remotely. Mm. So, we, we have again to, to square a circle and, and make coexist the very, of course, obvious need to protect uh, people and, and delegates and the uh, requirement, very serious requirement from, from, uh, from some countries that if there was a need to a vote, then we should come uh, to the building. The general conference, again, as you know, because you, you are um, a, a frequent permanent participant in those events, even from the, in your national capacities before, from the United States, the general conference is a big event. It's 4,000, sometimes 5,000 people. Um, so, of, co of course, uh, we, we have to combine and, and the, the, the commercial side, the promotional side, all the side events that take place with the policy making uh, that, that takes place. And, and so that required a number of agreements with, uh, with all countries uh, participating and even some surprises because after having agreed to hold a physical, though very limited meeting, we had to convince first delegations to come you know, in very, very uh, limited numbers. We had agreed to do that. And then on the Sunday, the Sunday before the conference was open, uh, we had a couple of cases of COVID-19 and groups of countries, political groups, demanded that the conference be turned into a hybrid um, experience. So you can imagine that was a very short night for our, our IT guys <laughs> that had to convert very rapidly to hybrid and allow the uh, platforms um, that allow for um, interpretation. I'm, I'm sorry to talk about this this, uh, you know, um, uh, things that may, may seem um, mundane, but, you know, we have to make policy and policy requires having people um, on board and, and being able to do that. And it was very, very difficult. So I would say the conference went well. We were, of course, limited to, to taking uh, the, mi the minimum um, number of issues. Uh, also member states were, I think, um, uh, comprehend, uh, they were, I would, I, would, I would say, sympathetic to the idea of not uh, trying to limit the uh, amendments, changes, modifications to some of the yearly resolutions that we have, so we could minimize the time of, of discussions. But it was, um, it was difficult. In the end, it was, it was possible. Uh, hope, 
let's hope that it is it was uh, the the one and last conference in these conditions. So you don't you don't expect to use the technology that you've now applied to this first uh, this first instance. You don't you don't see using that in the future because uh, many not of us have been scale. not at this scale. I, I think it, hmm. it's it's. Um, I don't know, it would be interesting to, to hear from your experience. I think it is clear that, that virtual uh, meetings uh, have advantages, uh, also uh, budget-wise um, in, in some instances. Um, and I guess that having seen that we are able to do what we are doing now at, at the moment, uh, I see that you have a, a very large number of participants and very happy to, to see that. So in some cases, we have seen that the, the audiences uh, are bigger, much, much bigger than they would be uh, if we were you know, conducting a, a physical uh, activity or a course here in, in Vienna. And I'm sure that for the NEA is the same. Um, so this has been, a, if you want, a good externality out of a very bad thing. Yeah, I, I agree. I think we're going to see um, a hybrid approach, yeah, to, so to speak. I think we're going to use these kinds of platforms uh, going into the future, but I think it's hard. You can't replace the um, the immediacy of a physical meeting either. So I think we're going yeah. to do both. Um, so let, let's leave COVID behind for a bit and talk we'll talk about the global situation. Uh, now that you've been director general for the last uh, almost year, what what's your view of the global situation when it comes to the use of nuclear energy and nuclear technology? I think we are at a fascinating time because uh, one can see that there is a growing uh, recognition that we have to put the debate on a different uh, level um, and on, on, on different premises than, than, than they, they were uh, before. I, I, at the risk, and, and allow me to oversimplify, but at the risk of oversimplifying, we can say that we've been for, for, for the last few years um, uh, uh, talking past each other. There's you know, people who uh, attach an importance to, to the contribution of nuclear energy. Um, we know what it can provide, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have another side of the debate which continue to repeat a very critical approach to uh, nuclear energy as if there was no point of convergence. What I start to see is that this is changing. This is changing for a number of reasons, which are very important. Uh, what, uh, first of all, of course, there is the, um, uh, the um, uh, climate change um, issue, which is not unique, but the climate change um, problem and the challenges that we are having make it more and more difficult to take uh, off the table a technology like nuclear with all the characteristics. I'm not going to regurgitate what nuclear energy brings, but it's clean, it's dispatchable, it's stable. So to make a, a serious, economically sustainable um, case for um, a clean and decarbonized economy, while at the same time excluding nuclear energy uh, it doesn't sound like an honest debate. It sounds like an ideological debate. And of course, we are all entitled to our ideologies, beliefs, and um, preferences, and that there's nothing wrong about that. But we are on a place where we are, where we need to make policy, contribute to make policy, and bring solutions, solutions to the people out on the street uh, that need energy that need electricity and, and do not want to continue destroying the uh, planet. Uh, more simple than that, it's very difficult to put it. So I see a recognition on that. But from this very generic level that I see this change, we also see it in, in many countries that are uh, looking more and more to nuclear energy. They are coming more and more to us. And we can talk about that later if you want, but they are uh, asking more questions, they are seeing that the option can also apply to them under different circumstances. It has to do with some other very interesting sides of these debates, like innovation and, and other things. So what I was going to say is that apart from the statistics, we all know 10 to 15 percent of the global energy, one third of the clean energy, all of that, I believe, is more or less well known. What we need is 
is this um, infection in the curve where nuclear is considered seriously and we are having a mature debate about what kind of place we can have in the, in the current uh, cir circumstance, in the middle of the global crisis, in the middle of one of the worst recessions um, that we are know that we have known even worse than 2008. The other day I was participating in a conference with Dave Malpass, president of the World Bank, and he was describing it in very, very clear terms. So I believe that we have to uh, uh, go to rational solutions that would uh, include, uh, of course, nuclear. What I said, as you remember, in Madrid, and I have been saying this all, and I will be saying this all my way uh, to Glasgow, is that nuclear has a place at the table. We are not dancing on top of the table, uh, but we have a place at the table. So let's hear what we have to say. So let's talk about Glasgow for just a second. What, what role do you think the agency will take in Glasgow? Well, um, as I said, um, Madrid was, uh, for us, was a uh, first time. Um, many people thought that it was not prudent for the DG or the new DG of the IEA to be there. And uh, our experience there was, was positive. There was some um, uh, curiosity about, uh, about us, but it was the first one. Um, uh, I started working with the uh, British uh, presidency, with State Secretary of Trauma, and, uh, and also the Italian um, um, co-presidents um, looking at what we are going to do there. What we uh, expect is to uh, have an, an opportunity to present the angle of uh, nuclear energy as uh, part of a solution that um, is done in harmony uh, with uh, renewables, which is uh, extremely important and that can integrate itself into um, every um, realistic model that we can be looking um, uh, into the future. Of course, you can have ideal um, scenarios where you have a, re a complete replacement of the energy matrices ar around the world, but everybody knows that this is not realistic. So with the elements at hand, what can we do and what um, uh, nuclear energy can provide? And I can say that my idea is, is, is to be there um, together perhaps with the with private sector, with uh, operators, with, with regulators, uh, with uh, a, a variety of actors um, in, in the nuclear uh, activity to um, make a, or to present uh, uh, as a comprehensive um, image uh, of the sector as, uh, as possible. No, it's interesting to me because um, you, you mentioned um, some of the non-proliferation work that the agency does. And that, of course, is the agency's most visible uh, mission. That's, that's what usually gets you in, in the newspapers uh, with the issues related to non-proliferation. But you do now have this model of a few years ago, you changed the M for peace and development. And I wonder, you know, in your position as director general, how much time do you have for the development part versus the non-proliferation part? How much time do you have to go to Glasgow and places like that? Well, well, it, it's of course it's, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, I would say um, the developmental um, side of the agenda has, has, has always been there. Um, what we are trying to do is to be more efficient. And if I can, um, put it in a word, to be more impactful um, uh, for us and for many countries. We are 172. And you can imagine when you, when you compare that with the uh, countries that are into the nuclear energy production uh, business, this leaves more than 100 uh, countries that are coming to the agency for other reasons, for other reasons, and they value this enormously. It is maybe difficult for those who are in nuclear energy alone to understand this, but they are here because of the food security. They are here because of the nuclear medicine. Uh, they are here because of the water management. These are the things that are bringing them uh, to, the, to the IAEA. Um, and now I would say um, the, the Peace and development, yes, but now we have also the, 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 the healing and the protection because um, against all odds, the, the agency had a lot to do and we did a lot on COVID-19, which was never um, imagined. Um, still today, many people are asking me, well, what is this? What is the IAEA doing? Uh, have, 
what do the, what do you have to do? And of course, when you know when you know a little bit about nuclear technologies, science, and application, you know the many things that um, uh, nuclear science can do. So we started with the uh, biggest uh, operation in the history of the IEA in terms of assist. We have been assisting 125 states. So well beyond what anybody should conceive as the developing world. So many countries, in, including, including here in, in Europe, have been turning uh, to the IEA for help. We have been providing RT, uh, PCR equipment, uh, tests, and so on and so forth. And, and now we are um, uh, launching a, a program where again, yet again, with nuclear technologies and nuclear derived technologies, we are preparing a zoonotic disease integrated action, Zodiac, we call it. We work with FAO, we work with other international organizations. So as you can see, it is really a, a, a very big um, part of what we believe uh, we, we can do. And for the first time, the IAEA has been um, requested to join the UN, uh, the UN uh, crisis management uh, task force created by the Secretary General to address this, this pandemic. So um, as you can see, a formidable uh, tool, so let's use it uh, well. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's amazing that um, the IEA became such a, a very visible um, participant in, in responding to the COVID crisis. And I heard from a lot of countries were very grateful for the assistance they received from IEA. Um, as I mentioned non-proliferation a while back, and, and this is something I'm yeah. going to appreciate your perspective. I'm often asked about the nexus point between commercial nuclear power and nuclear proliferation. Um, and it's a, it often comes up in many conversations about the future of, of nuclear energy. How, how do you see this? How do you respond to that, that question? There are two levels to, to that. It's a very, very good question because uh, some are saying, well, if there's, if there's more nuclear, then there will be more uh, risks, mm -hmm. spreading the risk by saying that. My, my gut feeling is that this, this, this looks like people moving the goalposts. Um, when 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 uh, when you satisfy a question or a doubt, then another comes. Let me say on, on two levels. One is the re is the level of the uh, of the nuclear operations and activities around the world, and we can talk about this. But first, 2020 marks the 50th anniversary of the entry into force of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. 50 years, half a century ago, the international community solved this question by saying what is needed to uh, have a peaceful nuclear energy. And when you um, subscribe to this treaty and you join the IAEA and you sub submit your facilities to comprehensive safeguards, agreements, and, uh, and if possible, uh, additional protocols, then the benefits of nuclear energies and applications are open for everybody. That this treaty refers to this as an, as an inalienable right. So when I hear people say these things, I wonder whether they know what they're talking about. I mean, mm -hmm. this was an issue that we as an international community solved half a century ago, because we knew that the, the, of course, nuclear technology is not um, any technology and there is a potential uh, malevolent use. As for chemical weapons, you were referring, I have a chemical past. I was very involved with the negotiation of the Chemical Weapons Convention and then the setting up of the OPCW. So I know that. Uh, do people use less um, you know, chemical uh, or, or chemical products um, because there is a risk of um, chemical proliferation? Uh, no, what we need to have is a very strong normative um, um, structure underpinning uh, all uh, this uh, activity. And I think uh, we, we do have it. That being said, we have to be on top uh, of the business and always ahead of the curve in terms of um, how the technology has evolved uh, in, in our area of work for NEA and the IAEA. We, we, we don't have a stable um, uh, material to operate with. It's, a, it's an ever-changing um, 
technology, so it may pose uh, problems and solutions because what we see is that with, with new designs, uh, with new technologies being introduced, the proliferation resistance has in fact been improving. Uh, if you take curve uh, and if you compare um, what we have been doing and NEA has been helping a lot in, in nuclear safety and, and nuclear security as well, uh, we are moving, for example, in the area of research reactors, we have been able to reduce dramatically the, uh, the, the amounts of um, highly enriched uh, uranium around the world. So I think that the international community in general has been very alert on this and has been responding to, this, to these uh, challenges uh, as they were uh, presenting themselves. So uh, I don't have a particular um, uh, concern, of course, provided we have uh, a nuclear watchdog. <laughs> You, you, you did, you raised the issue about new technologies. And I wonder if there are any technologies in particular that the IEEA is watching and thinking about because, it, because we're, we're going to see a lot of new options come in the future. Indeed, indeed. It, 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 again, again, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating uh, domain. And we, and we see that throughout the spectrum from uranium processing and, and fuel fabrication uh, new designs for reactors, new methods of uh, building and decommissioning, um, new approaches to managing uh, radioactive waste and spent fuel. So all of this we are uh, following uh, from, uh, from a variety of perspectives, um, including non-proliferation and also uh, safety uh, and security. It has become cliche, of course, to talk about advanced large reactors and, and small and medium sized. But in general, what we see, and we are carrying out some work on that uh, here at the IEA, we are, we are increasingly looking at hybrid uh, energy systems, combining nuclear power uh, with renewables. We have some interesting uh, technical documents. We are working with the operators ar around the world um, to um, uh, uh, to have a, a good contribution. Uh, this idea, I would say, of a nuclear beyond electricity, if you allow me to put it in, the, in these terms, will be key uh, to, to helping uh, decarbonize sectors that rely heavily uh, on, fo on fossil uh, fuels such as industry, transport, uh, district heating, uh, and others. So um, in a nutshell, I would say we are trying to concentrate on those who are um, and have the, I would say, the potential to become uh, or to come to the market uh, sooner. Mm. You know, um, among, among those who are very interested in these new technologies are, are newcomers. You know, the countries that have not had nuclear power in the past, but now aspire to build their first nuclear facilities in, in Africa, the Middle East, uh, in, in Asia. What, what, what do you, what, what you, and this is an area where IEA is very active in engaging with these yeah. newcomer countries. What, what's the most exciting about this? And, and maybe what's well, most concerning well, about this? Well, like, uh, as you said, um, this uh, idea of the, of the newcomers uh, has been around for a long time. And now we, we start to see uh, concrete examples of that. Um, you, you see it with, with uh, the United Arab Emirates, you see it with uh, Belarus, you see it in Turkey, you see it in Bangladesh, um, you see it in many places that are really going seriously into, into nuclear. Egypt uh, now, other, other countries at perhaps a, a lower level of, of advanced, advancement, but seriously looking into this for the first time, Kenya, Ghana, Uzbekistan, um, in the Philippines. I mean, there are a good number of countries, some already um, uh, pouring concrete and some others um, seriously moving uh, uh, into that. As, as you know, uh, the agency for quite some time has put together, um, I would say, uh, an, an, a, a, a guidance and orienting, I would say, a roadmap, uh, which is called the Milestones document, which in fact it, um, is a collection of years and years of experience of uh, people like you and others who have been in the industry for many, many years. And, and 
uh, we put together uh, this, these milestones and this, this document, which was followed successfully by the, by, by the Emirates, for example, and, and by others as well, have provided uh, a very solid uh, point of reference uh, for many countries that uh, have turned to it um, regularly. As I was saying, we see uh, more and more countries uh, approaching us. Uh, my impression is that we will see more than a dozen be, um, um, turning in, in, into nuclear energy in the next decade or so. Um, uh, this without, uh, of course, referring, and it's another part of the, of the debate, to those um, increasing their uh, existing uh, share. So um, there, what we see, uh, Bill, is, is of course a promise, but also areas of, um, um, I would say, great priority where we need to make sure that we provide these countries with the necessary uh, guidance in terms of um, regulatory capacity, institutionality, all of these things continue to be um, a challenge, as I was saying. So we, we are trying to be as uh, clear um, and demanding as possible uh, when it comes to this, uh, to this very important um, uh, sides. Uh, by now, you know, uh, the other day I was looking at some statistics uh, uh, within this, this process of uh, helping um, some of these uh, newcomer countries. We have trained more than 700 experts um, in, in these countries. So uh, we see the, the, the community expanding um, and uh, I, I am uh, certainly optimistic. Uh, but of course, uh, there's a lot of work for, for all of us, not only for the IAEA. Yeah, I mean, what, what do you think the time frame is? Do you think you'll see um, nuclear power plants in these countries being built in the next decade? Do you think it'll take longer? Most definitely. Most definitely. I think, um, uh, well, I, I, I mentioned uh, the ones that are starting mm -hmm. uh, already, um, and I see uh, great determination in, in some others. So I think we will have... Uh, a group, a solid group of around 10 to 12 um, new countries added to the list uh, of, of those uh, which are, are at the moment uh, producing uh, nuclear energy. Not to talk about the, the, those adding or renewing and preserving. That's another, that's another matter, I know. Um, I want to go to some questions from the audience, but, but I want to circle back to where we started and talk a little bit more about the COVID crisis because this is something that um, has very long-term implications, not just for our respective agencies, but really for uh, for the nuclear sector itself. And I know that the IEEA has been very involved in in working with operators and others to um, to address the challenges of COVID. And I wonder if you have some broad perspective on how COVID has affected the nuclear sector and how it's affected the work of the uh, the regulators and the operators. And what do you what do you think the what do you think the long term is going to be? Well, uh, the situation now, uh, you know, with, when the pandemic started uh, in March, uh, we immediately um, uh, decided to um, uh, monitor the evolution uh, in in every country. We had surveys done um, in the areas of nuclear energy, nuclear safety, and nuclear security, and we produced a series of uh, special reports um, published uh, already in June um, at the, um, uh, to the Board of Governors, um, which were admittedly covering a limited uh, time span, but it was very interesting because it was very raw. We started day one when, when, when the pandemic um, uh, um, broke up, then we, we decided to start uh, uh, this, um, these reports and this service and I think, um, uh, and we will continue, now we are continuing, but of course now, unfortunately, the pandemic has settled and it's part of the current landscape, hopefully, God permitting, not, not for too long, but it's, it's the reality that we have now. At, the, at that moment, people were speculating that it could pass. So um, we, we saw first, uh, taking stock of what we saw, what we saw was a tremendous, I would say, resilience, 
and uh, predictability and dependability uh, of the fleet around the world and the regulators. We saw very interesting cases where, of course, the regulators um, and operators were, uh, were having themselves, as we did in our own operations, reorganizing themselves, moving into shifts and, and um, things to allow uh, the workers to protect themselves and to comply with national health uh, regulations. But we, we could see this uh, first uh, element uh, there. So um, uh, over the long term, we expect this accumulated experience to be to, to good, to good use. For example, regarding the supply chain, some operators uh, overcame um, some of their restrictions by carrying out uh, remote or hybrid inspections, audits, uh, manufacturing oversights, and other types of work. Um, so these, I think, could be trends that if allowed by regulators and if applied conscientiously, uh, we could expect to see them uh, after the pandemic. Um, so uh, this competitive and, and, and this resilience, I think, uh, was were uh, valued. We see, for example, uh, at the general conference, we had the scientific forum, as you know, devoted uh, to these issues. And when we could hear from some operators, including some from uh, from France, uh, indicating how the the, the whole grid um, kept stable and and uh, at, the, at the required levels because of the um, uh, the nuclear. Um, contribution. So um, uh, the need for flexibility in electricity generation and system operations, of course, will, I believe, characterize uh, future uh, energy systems over the medium and, and, and future um, um, term. So uh, we, we need to be looking more and more into that. There's some work we are, as you may have seen, we are carrying out with your uh, neighbors from the IEA um, as well, where we are trying to look into the replacement of coal and gas with variable renewables and, and, and try to, to have um, systems that are more uh, harmonious with the, uh, with the port of, of, of nuclear. So um, um, I, I believe that uh, it might be too early to have a final conclusion of uh, the current trends, but we've seen enough uh, to see that uh, the, there are areas where the current experience uh, can be projected into, into the future. The abnormal under COVID, under pandemic situations could be um, of use in, in future scenarios. Well, the, the first question from the audience is actually about the COVID crisis. And it's uh, mm -hmm. from Oliver Aldman, who was with Platts, uh -huh. and he asked, um, has the IAEA seen any impact on the rate of new nuclear construction globally from the coronavirus pandemic? And if so, what impact? Well, of course, there has been some, but uh, interestingly, um, uh, there was first criticality in Ostrovitz the other day, so there hasn't been a significant uh, uh, delay uh, there. Um, we are not seeing... Um, or, or haven't been informed in our contacts with, with uh, uh, countries, um, uh, significant delays. There, there may be, uh, but in, in general, in the, for the projects under construction, uh, we don't see anything uh, out of the ordinary or extraordinary. It's good to hear. Um, another question from um, Jeremy Gordon, who's with Directors of Fluent and Energy. Um, you and some other players are securing uh, for nuclear the seat at the clean energy table that's been denied for many years. But where do the doors still need to be open to nuclear and which doors will be the hardest to open? Well, this is, a, of course, is a political question. Um, and this is why we decided to, to uh, have the debate, to participate in the open debate, which is never easy. Um, there are dissenting voices, and rightly so. Um, we, we feel that there is, there is a need to, uh, to reach out. I'm trying to do that as much um, as I can. Uh, we need to uh, have a concerted, um, I would say, 
action with um, countries that are considering and, that, and want to uh, use the nuclear energy option to help them in their uh, political uh, uh, debates. What we see, for example, Bill, is that in, in some cases for these countries, having the authoritative uh, voice of the IAEA is of great help for them. Uh, because uh, in the rough and tumble of the political debates at home, sometimes it is, it is difficult or uh, the one argument or pushing for nuclear may be seen as an opportunity uh, for um, those opposing that idea to, to have a, a good uh, debate, a good political debate. So we can bring, and this is what I've been trying to say, we are not nuclear lobbyists, but we mm -hmm. are providing scientific empirical uh, data to, to make the case. Um, so in, in that sense, uh, I think um, there is a need uh, to help those that want to, um, like many other countries already, to benefit from nuclear energy and for the, and for the rest as well. I think the, the, the social acceptability question is one that does not limit itself to, um, to countries, but also to neighboring countries. Here uh, in the IAEA, we see, we see that a lot. Uh, some countries uh, also, and that is an important aspect that we try to address prudently and diplomatically, sometimes the nuclear mm, is an interesting football to use when there are other political discrepancies, if I can put it diplomatically. Mm. So that happens mm. and, that, and, and we need to try to be a useful uh, player in the sea. Um, a question from NukeNet, which is interesting. It gets back a bit to our discussion about non-proliferation. And the question is about the new reactor types. So we talked about the new technologies. And the question that they ask is, um, is there, or might there, because of these new technologies, need to be a review of the international framework on nonproliferation because of the new technology? Well, the short answer should be no, but, uh, but the, the very good question deserves a longer answer. Uh, the, uh, as, as you know, for example, if, they, if, if our NUCNET friends are referring to the normative, and by the normative, they are thinking about the the um, uh, safety standards, for example, uh, or the, um, the, the treaty law that, that exists, the, the, the Convention on Nuclear Safety, the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material, the Joint Convention and other things. What we can see is that by and large, by and large, these instruments and standards are um, technology neutral. Uh, and in general, what we see is that they are, they have the plasticity and the flexibility to be applied um, with, a, with a good degree of uh, effectiveness and efficiency to evolving technologies. That being said, that being said, um, I um, raised this issue with the, with the chair of the Commission of uh, Safety Standards. Um, here at the IEA and with INSAC, which, as you know, is a distinguished group of uh, advisors to the Director General on matters related to nuclear safety, so that we can look into um, at this with a magnifying glass, with a magnifying glass, and then to see technology, but by technology, there has been, for example, the very interesting issue of the mobile um, like loading um, reactors, but but with 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 the evolving modular modularity uh, that is brought to the table with some design, some American design, for example, uh, one can uh, have pointed questions that might require uh, adaptation. Adaptation, yes, but perhaps not an overhaul of the regula regulatory. Um, framework as, as we see this now. Um, World Nuclear Association has an interesting question that, that asks about the UNFCCC and whether you're going to do studies to support the work of the, of the UN 
in dealing with climate change and, and what role the IEA plays in that framework? Well, we, we, we are doing that. Uh, we, we are doing that. There, there are some studies that are already uh, out. Um, we do some, we have regular uh, publications um, on specifically on, on climate change that are trying to bring the analysis to the, I would say, uh, up to date and up to the state of the art uh, in, in general. And one of my um, intentions in um, getting closer to the global climate change debate is precisely that, to be able to um, inject uh, the point of view of uh, nuclear uh, into this uh, into these debates, or what we do with the with uh, IEA uh, and uh, and others. So um, with NEA, of course, but we are more or less in the same boat. We are talking about people who are not necessarily in the nuclear institutions. Uh, uh, so we can bring this uh, this element. It's not guaranteed. Is not guaranteed because there is pushback. Of course, there is pushback. Um, mm -hmm. But as I say, uh, as I said in the beginning of the conversation, Bill, I see there is, you know, there is a change, and that the the debate is 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 getting uh, different. The, the variable geometries that are being admitted. Here's a completely different question, and I know it's something you care a lot about, and because I know you've been taking you've taken a big leadership role in pushing for gender um, equality within the IEA itself. The question that, that we have from, uh, from outside is what can be done to ensure that the nuclear field and the nuclear fuel and the community become more diverse and more equity represent genders? Well, indeed, it's, it's one of those things. I think here the risk, um, the big risk we have is the risk, the risk of the sloganism, which I believe is, is uh, affecting the gender debate um, where you know, everybody's a gender champion, everybody says uh, nice things. Um, uh, what we need is to do something mm. about it. So as far as we are concerned from our modest uh, point of view, we've done two things. Internally, uh, I set a very ambitious uh, goal of getting to uh, parity uh, by 2025. It's very difficult, you know, because you're in, you lead an organization and you know how difficult it is because, of course, you are not, you are not hiring more women per se. Excellence, excellence, especially in a scientific organization, is the guiding principle. But what we want to do is to reach out to, to, the, to the excellence that also exists in women and which is not recognized. So this is one, um, uh, one, one goal. This goal requires at lower levels uh, a number, so an important number of um, regulatory and, and uh, human resources practice modifications, uh, which are required at every different level to make sure that the recruitment processes don't uh, allow for bias or, or invisible uh, filtering here and there. And it took us some months uh, to get there. We, we did it, we instated a number of modifications to the relevant um, administrative uh, matters. But this is, this is internal. And also the decision from the top. When I get um, uh, candidates for a position, normally you get two, three, etc. If I don't see uh, diversity in what I get, I don't even consider and I push back the, the recruit, much to the frustration of, of many of my line managers. Uh, I push it back. I don't want to see it because I know that there could have been an effort uh, to do better. And we are doing better. If I take my um, 10 months uh, in the job, um, uh, I pass because we are at uh, almost 60% of my the appointments in my time. But this is not about that. Um, to, to really uh, move um, the needle, uh, Overall, it takes a very sustained effort. So this is something that we are doing. We're trying to work with women in nuclear. We are trying to work with all those who are closer to the industry, to the universities, to academia, uh, so that we can have. A... The other thing we did 
was we have established a, a um, IAEA fellowship program, the uh, um, Marie uh, Sklodowska Curie IAEA uh, fellowships. We are going to have the first batch of fellows, a hundred this year. Uh, and I'm very proud of it. I hope, um, stay tuned, but I hope to be announcing it, uh, announcing the first batch at, uh, in a few weeks, already in a, in a few weeks. Um, we have many, many countries supporting us, even the private sector. So by doing this, we are doing something concrete. We are offering money, an opportunity for young girls and graduate uh, women and girls in, in every country. This is not, uh, you know, for one region or for the other. So that they know that if they need um, uh, some funds to complete their studies in nuclear, they have some, they have some, and, and they can uh, come and, and work, and it would be fantastic to have the NEA help us in that regard, because you have many members that are all our members as well, and I, I'm sure you have the same challenges in terms of, uh, of uh, diversity and, and, and bringing more uh, women to the nuclear family. Well, it's clearly it's clearly a, um, a growing priority across the nuclear sector. We're very involved in that, and uh, and of course, you know, we we certainly look forward to working with the IEA and, and working together with this. And you're, and uh, you and I were both participating in the International Gender Champions um, uh, webinar a, a while back, and I, I'm I'm looking forward yeah. to continuing that as well. So it's a I think these initiatives are extremely yeah. important, and and is something we have to take action with now. Um, let me. I have, we're running out of time. But let me ask a couple of nuclear safety questions before we yeah. go. One, one question is a very broad one, and, and that is whether you see, from your perspective, um, what do you believe the major issues in the field of nuclear safety over the next decade will be? Well, I think in terms of nuclear safety, there are uh, different areas. Uh, let, let us put it like this. I believe that uh, on on the one hand. Uh, we will need to be looking into, as we were saying a minute ago, uh, to, the, uh, to the new areas, the new technologies, the new developments, make sure that the regulatory schemes are solid and, and, and consolidated. Then another important area will be that of long-term operation. I think we are... Um, entering a phase of uh, preservation of a fleet. Um, this is going to be a solution that countries are going to uh, be turning um, spontaneously more and more. We are seeing it everywhere. Uh, and this, as you know, poses very specific uh, issues that require dedicated uh, attention. Um, there are, of course, um, areas where we need to be uh, very, very attentive in terms of uh, waste. There, I think also we are entering a, a, new, a new phase. Uh, in a few uh, weeks, I will be in Onkalo in, in, in Finland. Only yesterday, the Municipal Council of Östhammar voted in favor of the repository in Forsmark in Sweden only yesterday. So we can see that here again, at long last, the, this issue is uh, turning into a reality, uh, which is to be celebrated by all those who believe and who always knew that the technological answers were there, but now we will have, but of course, this will require a very dedicated, dedicated approach uh, in terms uh, of uh, safety. So um, these are but a few of things. Of course, there is the commissioning, um, and this is another area where uh, for those countries that are either um, replacing a fleet or um, phasing out the few countries that have decided to go that way, we are going to be extremely supportive. We are working very closely with them, like, like Germany, for example, uh, where we are going to be very close, um, you know, breaking new ground. As, as, as they go um, and, and providing the necessary um, uh, regula regulatory uh, approach. One thing that I intend to do is to work very, very closely with the regulators. I was 
it was again for the first time that the DG was attending the CSS um, uh, meetings. Uh, I, I want to be very close with that in very important essential community uh, of, of ours so that we are attuned to the, to the necessities of the market. Excellent. Well, let me, let me wrap up with a final question, which is a very specific question, but um, I, I, I think it also is very symbolic of the kind of concerns that people have about nuclear safety. And this, this comes from um, your native part of the world. The uh, person is actually writing from Uruguay. He's asking about uh, Argentina, actually. Um, uh -huh. yes, Atusha, very good. Atusha Reactor Unit 3, under, uh, which has been proposed to be built by China, China National Nuclear Cooperation. And uh, this person is asking, this is a, a new reactor design from, um, you know, from China. We, you know, China doesn't have a lot of experience in building in other countries. And um, what do you think about that? What's, how, how do you assure people the safety of, of something so, so different from what they're used to seeing? Um, and so this person is just asking, how do I know, basically, how do I know this is safe? Well, um, it, is, it is a very pertinent question. And one, of course, I like to answer because, um, you know, I'm the DG now, but I'm always an Argentine. And uh, the reality is that this is not bringing something um, revolutionary or new. Um, when this construction starts, and I am informed by, by, by Argentina that uh, the, the final decision has not been taken yet, are very advanced in their in their negotiations with the CNC um, with China, um, but there is no um, final decision yet. But when and, and if it happens, Argentina was the first country to run a nuclear reactor back in 74, and, and has been doing so uh, without um, any issue or, or problem. And um, for the for the the friend from uh, Uruguay. Um, they have two nuclear power plants on the same site. The, uh, the, this third will, will, would come over there. And I would say, as, as uh, it is recommended by the CNS, by the Convention on Nuclear Safety, a dialogue with the IRN, the Argentine Nuclear Regulatory Authority, is very important. And I know they are very open to discuss with, with their neighbors, as everybody else um, is. So I think, uh, yet again, uh, we need strong regulators, we need an open policy, we need information, we need transparency. And with that, nuclear is very strong. All right, well, on that note, um, while I would love to keep you here for another two or three hours talking about these issues, um, our time is up. Uh, Rafael, it's been a real pleasure to have you on this web chat. Uh, maybe, we should, maybe we should do this once a year. <laughs> I, 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 want to, I want to thank you. I want to thank NEA and you in particular. I think uh, this initiative of yours is extremely important uh, because we need to talk uh, to, the, to the community uh, at large. Um, I think you are addressing one of the, uh, of the weak points that uh, the, the sector has been having um, over the years, and this is not, not communicating enough. We need to, uh, to ventilate all the issues. We need to discuss all the issues. We need to explain. Um, our societies uh, deserve it. They deserve no less. And I think the nuclear se sector is mature and strong enough uh, to have this public debate. And as I say, to bring its contribution to the table uh, for everybody. And thank you very much. And thank you for your good partnership and, um, and, and very much look forward to working with you on all the issues we, that we discussed today.